Lord. And as we unpack the, the Christmas story this coming weeks, Lord, I pray that you would open up our hearts and minds, Lord. And for those that are here or watching online, Lord, I pray that they would uh, see Jesus, Lord, in this text, Lord. It's an important story for us to share. It's an opportunity uh, where people are open to hearing who Jesus is and what he came for. And so, Lord, uh, we thank you and just ask that you would um, speak to us this morning, Lord. Speak to us as we read the scriptures, Lord. Speak to us as we learn and listen more about you. And so, Father, uh, we thank you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, good morning. So glad to have you here. And hopefully you're all full of turkey. Everybody having turkey sandwiches, turkey with uh, eggs and turkey salad pumpkin pie, you know, all that good stuff. Um, just a quick announcement I forgot to mention. Um, our, our offering uh, box is, again, at the back. For those of you who don't know, there it's at the back. You can just put the envelope in there, put uh, money or check in there. That's fine. Uh, those of you who are joining us online, you can also um, click on that button and, and direct you to our online uh, button uh, so you can uh, donate uh, online as well. And uh, we're also going to have, uh, for our worship team, we're going to have a, just a brief meeting immediately after service. So just really quick. Shouldn't take that long. <laughs> Let's go out to lunch. <laughs> we can find a place open. Um, anyways, uh, we're just so glad to have you here. We're starting a new message called The Best Christmas Ever. And the reason I title it The Best Christmas Ever is because everybody seems to be kind of down, you know, with uh, the COVID thing and not being able to socialize as much. And, and I don't know what you did for Thanksgiving, but uh, my wife and I went camping and a lot of people were out and some people were gathered together and some people were spread out, but, you know, it makes it for a difficult time uh, to go through when you're not uh, with loved ones or friends and family. And so I pray whatever you did that you had a great time. And I think the next thing is to just enjoy Christmas. However way we're going to do it, whatever the governor says, <laughs> uh, we're just going to go ahead and make it the best Christmas ever. We're going to make it the best of the circumstances, and we're going to just have a great time of worshiping our Lord and Savior each and every Sunday. Um, so we're going to go ahead and get started with um, the best Christmas ever. Uh, how many of you remember growing up as a kid and going to this place that had books? Like It's called a library. Yeah, remember that? <laughs> remember the Dewey Decimal System? Remember how you had to pull out cards and stuff like that? You don't have to do that now. You Google everything. But I remember just growing up as a kid and going to the public library. My, my mom would take us and we'd see all the books. It was two stories and lots of books. And I remember that everything else was kind of boring, but, you know, we were little kids, so my mom always took us to the children's section, which always had exciting colors or pictures of books and illustrations, and it was just a great time to be in the children's book. And my mom would periodically uh, check out some books, and my mom was a really good storyteller, just like moms can only do. And she would read stuff, and, you know, if it had an exclamation point, she would make sure to raise her voice and say, look at this, or she would point us to the pictures, and she would ask my brother and I some questions, because she would take the book, which is really just paper and, you know, uh, uh, ink on there, and just make it come alive, make it kind of vivid. And that's really what the Christmas story is about. It's a, it's a narrative story for us to look at and make it really come alive in our lives so we can understand everything that God said was true. It's a story that we should be filled with excitement. And I want you, as we do, to listen to the story of Christmas. Listen to all the events that are taking place, all the miraculous events. And I hope that it would come real and alive to you. And my mom was really good at reading the book. So when I was young, I used to read a lot of different books. And I remember uh, getting this one particular book, and it was called The Monster at the End of the Story. Okay, and as a little kid, that's kind of a little scary, but it was a Sesame Street book. And so I had Grover. You remember, anybody remember Grover? It's kind of like a bluish uh, animal. I don't know what he was, but had a little kind of reddish nose. And he was the one telling the story. And so you would flip through the story. And, uh, you know, he would say, well, I wonder what it is. Is it under the bed? Is it like, you know, in the closet? And you would keep reading this story. And, you know, you want to get to the end of the book. But then uh, when it gets to the last couple of pages, Grover is like really scared. You know, he's like, oh, no, we're almost to the last page. Or 
You know, it's the next page. And then he opens up the last page and he says, oh, I am the monster at the end of the book. You know, and I just remember as a little kid, I was wondering what the monster was. You know, there was so much anticipation, so much things you were looking forward to to get to the end of the book. And so the Christmas story is really about telling us the end of God's story, of what he planned to do was true. And so just as much as we anticipate Christmas every year, by the way, 25 days left after today, right? Today's the 30th. 25 days to get your shopping done, okay? So do your best. But it was an important announcement that God would make. I mean, think of all the important announcements that we have. We have birthdays, we have graduations, uh, marriages, you know, baby shower announcements and all these different things. But we all experience a moment of salvation, of, of celebration when an announcement is made and it's actually fulfilled. But what about an announcement that's unexpected? What about an announcement that's maybe surprising? There are not the announcements maybe some of you were expecting. And so let's go ahead and turn to our Bibles, turn to Matthew chapter 1. We're going to go ahead and start in verse 18 through, I think, 25. Because our story focuses on one of the uh, characters in the Christmas story, a man named Joseph. Matthew chapter 1, we're going to start in verse 18 and kind of work all the way, like I said, to verse 25. Here's what God's word says. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Now Matthew is the one who's telling this story to us. And very quickly in verse 18, he's introducing the characters, he's introducing the plot. I mean, think of it, it's a narrative story. And he's letting us know about a situation that is going on. If you ever notice in some of the old TV shows, like in, in the 50s and 60s and 70s, like the Andy Griffith show or something like that, there's always something going on, right? And then something's happening, right, that they have to resolve. And by the end of the 30-minute the segment, you know, the problem is resolved. And it's kind of that same thing we have here in Scripture. We have this narrative story of where there's these characters, there's this plot, and there's a problem that needs to be resolved. Now, the characters that we see are Joseph and Mary, right? And we see that they're a very young couple. We have to remember that during that time, uh, Jewish custom, uh, the girl could have been as young as 12 years old. She was probably definitely a young teenager. And Joseph himself would have been a young man as well. But Joseph and Mary, they're, they're, they're more than just engaged. We always talk about this word betrothed. And what does it mean? Does it mean engagement? No. Does it mean kind of marriage in our typical American culture? Yeah, probably closer to that. It's just that they didn't have the celebration. I mean, that's probably the best way I can describe it. But in the minds of the people at that time, they were married. They were husband and wife. But we see in verse 18 that there is a problem, right? Mary's having a child. And Joseph, it's not Joseph, it's not the father. Sounds like something we should see on a Jerry Springer show or something like that. But there's this problem, there's this dilemma that has to be dealt with. And so Matthew is slowly telling us this story. And so he goes on in verse 19 and he says, And her husband, right, he already calls her husband, her husband Joseph, being a just man and, and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. Now again, we have to understand that in Jewish custom, when a woman, if she was pregnant and it wasn't you, you could easily divorce her. All you had to do is really write kind of a bill of sale, like, okay, we're done. And just write it and she can go off and he can go off. But I also have to think that we have to look at the character of Joseph. The Bible says he's a just man. Some might, translation might say he's a righteous man. And I might go on a little further saying he's a godly man. And the reason I say that is because he knows the law. He knows his, his rights under the law that they're provided. And so he gets to know all these things, but he is a just man. And because he was a just man, he also wanted to show compassion. Look at what it says in that last part of verse 19. 
resolved to divorce her quietly. He didn't want to make a public spectacle or, or do all these things and say, well, look, she's with somebody else's kid and I don't know what's going on. And I, you know, I just want to, you know, get her out of my life. And you know what? Nobody should even go with this lady. She's damaged goods. He doesn't want to do that. He shows compassion on her. He really loves her and cares for her. He doesn't understand what's going on. But it says he's ready to divorce her quietly. And so as we read in verse 20, I think the uh, first part of verse 20, first uh, sentence here, it says, but as he considered these things. Now Joseph knew his rights. He knew he could get a divorce. But he's giving careful thought on what he's doing. It's not impulsive. When people get divorced today, uh, they come up with all sorts of excuses, but now they come up with a uh, common one, right? Irreconcilable differences. What does that mean? It just means we can't agree and we don't get along. That's all it means. But Joseph is considering these things. He's thinking about it. He's pondering on the choice he has to make. He's giving some careful thought. But it would also let us know that he's kind of making up his mind to divorce her. But then there's a word right there, right after that, immediately that says, behold. Behold. And we'll see that a lot in the Christmas story. And that word behold means look. As, as the reader, you know, remember I said this is a narrative type of story. Behold, it would be someone say, look. Matthew's trying to draw our attention to something very important. Because it says, look, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Now, an angel of the Lord, we don't know who this angel is. And it was in his dream that it happened. It wasn't like it happened outside while he was awake. But what's important is not what the, who the angel is. What's important is what the angel says. And so it says this, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. Verse 21, she will bear a son and, you're, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from sins. There's three things to notice here, and they're not in your handout, so if you're taking notes, write these things down. The angel tells Joseph, don't be afraid, he says. In other words, he says, don't worry. There's nothing to fear. Don't worry, Joseph. There's a better thing going on. The second thing the angel tells Joseph is, stay married. In other words, don't divorce like you're planning to do. The Bible uses this word called take. And that word take literally means to cling together, to come together. So stay married, Joseph. Do not get a divorce. The third thing that the angel tells Joseph is the name. Now, how many of you have kids? Okay. Remember the most difficult decision was naming your child? And remember, some of you, if you did like my wife and I, you get the list of baby names, right? And it's like hundreds of pages. And then there's always the top 10 names of a baby boy or top 10 names of a baby girl. And they always change year after year. But it was a difficult decision, right? It's an important decision. Why? It's going to be on their birth certificate. It's going to be on that document that's going to run through the rest of their life. It's an important decision to name. And Joseph and Mary don't have to worry about it. The angel tells them, name the baby Jesus. And that name is so important. But Jesus was a common name at that time. So there'd be a lot of other people called Jesus. But there was going to be something about this Jesus that was different. And what was different is not just uh, Jesus the name, but what Jesus was going to do, as it says at the latter part of verse 21, for he will save his people from their sins. You see, Jesus came to deal with sins, and his name gave expressions to a very significant truth. 
that I'm going to save you from your sins. And so Matthew, again, connects the meaning between Jesus' name and the significance of it. He says this in verse 22. He said, all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. The prophet Isaiah is what he's quoting here. He says, behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. I think we also have to remember that the Israelites, the Jewish people, had not heard from God for not 100 years, not 200 years, but for 400 years. They had not heard from God at all. And all of a sudden, God is now coming in the scene at the right time, at the right place that he already knew. God comes into the world. It's God in the flesh or God incarnate. He comes into the world to be with his people. And let me also tell you that when Jesus died, he didn't leave us alone. He's still with us. We sang that song, you know, God with us. And I'll share something very important in just a few minutes. But Matthew is connecting what was going to happen and what was prophesied in the Old Testament to what the events that were happening now. That God not only saves us, but also God is going to be with us. Matthew 28 verse 20 says this, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded and Behold, there's that word again, and behold, and look, Matthew's drawing our attention, I am with you, what? Always. Jesus is always with us. Not only had the angel said it when he was born, but Jesus said it, said it before he left. And so now Joseph has an important decision to make. Look at verse 24. When Joseph woke from his sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded. He took his wife. Joseph demonstrated something that we as followers of Jesus have to do every day. And that's trust and obey. I trust what the angel is saying. And to prove my trust, I'm going to do what he says. And so Joseph, again, being a young man and not a rich man, as we discover in Scripture, that they were very poor people, takes Mary to be with his wife. And it says in verse 25, but he knew her not until she had given birth to a son. And he called his name Jesus. Joseph followed God's plan. And if we read Luke's account, we see kind of Mary's account of an angel also speaking to her. But Joseph is to be admired as a husband and as kind of the father, even though it's not his kid, when you think about it. But he's going to lead this family. And he's going to follow God's plan. And now the good news has come into the world. There's finally an answer to the sin problem. You know what the world has today is we have a sin problem. We've always had it year after year. And we still continue to have a sin problem. And the only solution to sin is Jesus. The only solution to sin is Jesus. And that's why God came to save us and to be with us. God came to save us and to be with us. Because he's resolved the sin problem. God's story continues in each of you if you're a follower of Jesus. He's called you to be his people. He's called his church to be his church. And you may not be a Joseph, you may not be a Mary, but you are you. And the Bible says you are fearfully and wonderfully made. 
You are made in the image of God. You are made in the image of God. I want to encourage you, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, to write this verse down right here. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 18. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 18. If you're a follower of Christ, read that text. And it's going to tell you that you've been redeemed. And it's going to tell you a whole bunch of other things. Because I think we have to be reminded that as followers of Jesus, we're fearfully and wonderfully made, but we're redeemed. We're loved. We're blessed. And if you're not a follower of Jesus, I want to encourage you to go on the internet and look at Acts chapter 4, verse 12. Acts chapter 4, verse 12 simply says this, And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. If you want to come to know Jesus, you have to realize that salvation came through Jesus Christ. He came to die for you. And when he died on the cross, he bore all the sins of the world. And he was buried and he rose again that third day. And he showed that he can truly conquer death. And when you die today, you know, if today's your day, if tomorrow's your day, 10 years from now is your day. And if you don't know Jesus, you're not going to be in the presence of God. But if you do, you'll be in God's presence. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. It's the place we want to be. It's the announcement that we finally have been waiting for. I know for me, you know, this coronavirus has been frustrating, not only as a pastor, but just in general, just in life. The politics of everything going on has been frustrating. You know, the presidential elections, and then just kind of the politics that happened in California have been very frustrating. But my hope is not in the governor. My hope is not in the president. My hope is in Jesus Christ. And I am reminded that I have to pray for our leaders. And I have to pray for them. It doesn't matter if I elected, I chose them or not. We still have to pray for them. God is going to be with us. Isn't he with us today? He was with you if you were a follower of Christ when you drove into the church parking lot. And he'll be with you wherever you go. That's a promise that he said. Let's go ahead and stand and bow our heads. Lord, thank you for all that you've done, Lord. Thank you for showing us the birth of Jesus. Thank you, Lord, of this beautiful story that has taken place. And Lord, whoever we are, Lord, we are ourselves, Lord, and maybe you've been speaking to us right now. Maybe through the online uh, service today, Lord, you've been speaking to some of us. And we feel that need to call on the name of Jesus so that we too could be saved. If that's you this morning. If you want to call on the name of Jesus, just say a simple prayer from wherever you're at. Say something like this, Lord, I know that I'm a sinner. Lord, I know that my life is not right with you. And Lord, I want to change my life. And so today, Lord, I ask for forgiveness of my sins. I ask, I ask Lord, that you would Come into my life. You would change my heart. That you would make me a new person today. And Lord, I know you can change me. You promise that I can have a new life with you. I now trust you, Lord. I now commit my life to you. 
And I invite Jesus in my heart to be my Lord and my Savior. And Lord, I promise to live out my life faithfully for you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let's sing. I love you, Jesus, Jesus, holy and anointed one, you're the risen and exalted one Jesus your name is like honey on my lips your spirit's like water to my soul your word is a lamp to my feet Jesus, I love you, I love you, your name is like honey on my lips, your spirit's like water to my soul, your word is a lamp to my feet. Jesus, I love you, I love you, my Jesus, I love you, love you. Let us know of your decision, and we want to help you on your spiritual journey and your walk with Jesus. I'm going to go ahead and pray. We're going to sing one more last song, and that'll close us out for today. Thank you again for being here this morning, and look forward to seeing you as well next week. Don't forget Saturday, December 5th, you can come and help and decorate the church. We'll bring out some of the Christmas decorations and trees we have to decorate and make this a very festive environment to remind us of the true reason for the Christmas season. Let's go ahead and pray. Lord, thank you for bringing us here, and Thank you, Lord, for just this beautiful story, Lord. Again, recounting the birth of Jesus, Lord, uh, the miracle that was done, Lord. And now, Father, we can see you guiding every step of the story. You sent the angel. It was the Holy Spirit who conceived with Mary, Lord. We see that this story was foretold in, in Isaiah the prophet, Lord. And, Lord, it's a reminder that God came to save us and to be with us. And so, Lord, help us to live in a way that just shows, a, shows us, Lord, the value of each and every one of us, Lord. Not just those here in our church today, Lord, but those 
in our community, those in our uh, workplaces, Lord, those that live across the street or nearby, Lord, each one of them needs to hear the good news of Jesus. And so, Father, thank you that we can celebrate it every day of our lives. In Jesus' name I pray. Everyone said, amen. Let's sing.